We're going in three, two, one. Whatever it takes. Look at the world around you. Is it not more peaceful? Let's finish this. Whatever it takes. Yo, what up, what up, everyone? Tay here, and if you are in the U.S., I hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. And today, what I want to do is I want to talk a bit about Thanos and some popular theories that tie into the Eternals and the Celestials, as well as some of the new stuff we learned about Thanos in the Avengers Endgame Art of book, which is quite a bit, actually. But first, please like and subscribe if you're a fan of Marvel and the MCU. And you can check out other recent Marvel videos down in the description down below. There is the recent Loki video, and we also talked about Falcon and the Winter Soldier in the last video, and the new Captain America replacement, and the Thunderbolts, and how that could tie into She-Hulk, and Bruce Banner, and Red Hulk, all of that, and a bunch of other videos. So check those out down there if you would like. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. Titan was like most planets. Too many mouths, not enough to go around. And when we faced extinction, I offered a solution. And they called me a madman. And what I predicted came to pass. All right, so first, let's start with this short section on everything we know about Thanos' origins and backstory that are definitively canon in the MCU, which isn't a ton. We know a lot about adult Thanos, but we don't have a ton of canon details on his history and his past. So what we do know is that he grew up on Titan with his father, Alars, who was one of Titan's leaders and chief scientists. And then later, when he was in his late teens or early 20s, he discovered that Titan was highly overpopulated, and to prevent the death of the entire population and the planet, he suggested that half the population be chosen at random to die. And the leaders of Titan found this proposal completely blasphemous, and therefore Thanos was exiled as punishment. Now, we don't have an exact time frame on however many hundreds or thousands of years ago this would have happened, but when asked in an interview how old the MCU version of Thanos is, the Avengers Endgame screenwriters Marcus and McFeely didn't give us an exact number, but they said that he is very old, older than people think. Which, in the comics, Thanos is an Eternal with a mutated deviant gene, so due to his Eternals lineage, this gives him a near-infinite lifespan. So if I had to guess on how old Thanos is in the MCU, my guess is that he would be around the same age as Odin, give or take. Now, as a lot of you probably know, originally we were going to see much more of these details on Thanos' origins in flashback scenes for Avengers Infinity War. At one point, there was even up to 30 minutes of screen time covering Thanos' backstory that was included in one of the early drafts of the Infinity War script. And then later, when the Russo brothers decided to cut these scenes from the movie, these story ideas were passed on from Marvel Studios to author Barry Liga to expand upon in Thanos Titan Consumed, which was originally planned to be the MCU's first canon novel. You know, kind of the same way that the Star Wars universe has canon novels and canon comic books. But then, shortly before the book's release, Marvel Studios backpedaled on this idea and then declared that the book would no longer be considered actual canon. And I think the reason they probably did this is so they could explore Thanos' origins in either a future movie, like perhaps The Eternals or The Eternals sequel, or maybe a Thanos movie that covers his origins, or what I think would be the best choice is a Thanos Origins Disney Plus show, which would just be perfect in my opinion. They could even do it where each episode covers a different point in Thanos' past at a different age. So yeah, anyways, now let's move on and get to the Thanos theories.
these carriers can use the stone to mow down entire civilizations like wheat in a field. All right. So there's been this theory that's been around for quite a while now that this flashback moment of the celestial Essen the Searcher destroying this world in Guardians of the Galaxy was actually Thanos' homeworld, Titan. Now, I always thought this was a fun theory, but I never really bought into it that much. However, now I do think there's at least a possibility that Marvel Studios were considering making this the official backstory for Titan's Demise. Because the art of Avengers Endgame just came out, and in the back of the book, there's a section that's reserved for concepts that were a part of the script, but never ended up making it into either of the two movies. One of which is this section on Thanos and his early years on Titan, which shows Titan and its people at the height of their civilization. And in this art, we see key frame moments that were cut from the Thanos flashbacks that were originally going to be a part of Infinity War. And I just gotta say, some of these are low res versions of the concept art because that book just came out. We don't have all, you know, nice clean versions of all the pieces. So sorry about that. Anyways, so in this section we see that Titan was once a blue Earth-like planet, and we see a younger version of Thanos go before the leaders of Titan in this giant stadium to propose that half the population be killed off in order to save the other half, which of course resulted in him being exiled. Now, in the Thanos Titan Consumed book and in the comic series Thanos Rising, when Thanos was exiled from Titan, he was just sent off into space. But Marcus and McFeely revealed that in Infinity War, what was going to happen is we were going to see Thanos exiled to Titan's moon, where he would be sent to this prison mining facility, which was presumably there to mine the moon for resources to send back to Titan. And it's in this concept art that we can see that Thanos witnessed Titan being destroyed from his vantage point on this moon, which is the same moon that Thanos would later destroy using the Power Stone in Infinity War. Which now seems kind of fitting, as after viewing this concept art, you can't help but wonder if it was the Power Stone that was originally planned to destroy Titan. Because in this concept art, you can see Thanos look on as this bright purple light, this purple blast, spreads across and engulfs Titan. Which looks extremely similar to this moment in Guardians of the Galaxy when Essen the Celestial uses the Power Stone to destroy this planet. Now, hypothetically, let's say this is what happened, that the Celestials came and destroyed Titan. Well, in the comics, the Celestials have destroyed tons of planets. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the planet we see being destroyed in Guardians of the Galaxy is Titan. It could be. Based on the level of detail we get, it's not a lot. It's enough that they could make that fit if they wanted to. Now, of course, this concept art doesn't mean this is what happened to Titan in the past canon of the MCU. But it could mean that Marvel Studios had plans for this to potentially be what happened to Titan before Thanos' backstory was cut from the movie. Because this would, of course, tie the movie to Guardians of the Galaxy, but it would also help set up and build anticipation for the Celestials' appearance in the Eternals movie. And you're probably thinking, well, that can't be how Titan died off, how the population of Titan died off and how Titan was destroyed because they already said that it was overpopulation that destroyed Titan. Which is true, but that's also very, very vague. And whatever specifically happened to Titan turned a once blue thriving world that looked very much like Earth into a burnt, withered, dead planet which would line up with this giant blast of purple energy that we see in this concept art that appears to be spreading around and engulfing the planet. And we'll never know exactly what happened on Titan until when or if Marvel Studios decides to tell that story, which is why they probably left it kind of vague, is so they could come back and fill in the details later if they wanted to. And there are ways that the death of Titan could be due to both overpopulation and the Power Stone. For instance, in the comics, the Titans are actually Eternals who came from Earth and then settled on Saturn's moon, Titan. Now, in the MCU, Titan is not Saturn's moon. It's its own planet in a different galaxy. 
But we do know that Thanos' family is the same as it was in the comics, which would seem to confirm that, like in the comics, in the MCU, Thanos is an Eternal with a mutated deviant gene. Which, on a quick side note, that's what some of this bonus art in the back of the book shows, alternate designs on the people of Titan. Which I think some of these designs are supposed to be different variations on how the rest of Thanos' family could have potentially looked in the movie, like his mother, Suisan, or his brother, Eros. But anyways, let's get back to this whole Celestials theory. Okay, so in the comics, the Eternals were created by the Celestials. Then over the course of many centuries, the Celestials returned to Earth four times to check in on the Eternals. And this was the four Celestial hosts. And the final host, the fourth host, is that of Judgment, where if the Celestials are not sufficiently impressed by what their creations, the Eternals, have accomplished with their lives and their society, then the Celestials will judge against them and wipe out all life on that planet. So if in the MCU, the Celestials were to visit Titan to check in on their creations, since the Titans are Eternals, they would have observed what Thanos observed that the population of Titan has screwed up their society by letting it become overpopulated, and therefore Titan would fail the final judgment and the Celestials would destroy the planet. Or something like that, you know. I'm not saying this is what happened, this is just an example of how they could make it work if they wanted to. And having the destruction of Titan happen at the hands of the Celestials with the Power Stone could also be how Thanos learned about the Infinity Stones and got the idea to use the Infinity Stones to fix the universe's overpopulation problem, the same way the Celestials would have wiped out Titan due to its overpopulation. And there's another way this could all kind of work together with not necessarily the Celestials, but the Power Stone. And it kind of ties back to something we talked about in this past video a little while back. And in that video, I talked about how what if in the Eternals movie we see the Infinity Stones in flashback scenes? That basically, what if Kronos and the ancient Eternals, the first Eternals, could have been in possession of one of the Infinity Stones as its protectors? You know, kind of the same idea as how Asgard at one time were the protectors of the Tesseract. Now in that video I speculated that it would make sense for that stone to be the Mind Stone because that could explain how Thanos came to have the Mind Stone when he later gave it to Loki in the first Avengers movie. But what if instead of it being the Mind Stone, the Ancient Eternals were in possession of the Power Stone? Because we know the Infinity Stones can be used as an unlimited source of energy. We saw both Red Skull and S.H.I.E.L.D. use the Tesseract as an unlimited source of energy in Captain America the First Avenger, Captain Marvel, and the Avengers. So what if at one time long ago, the ancient Eternals on Titan were in possession of the Power Stone and used it as a way to power their entire planet? Once for a moment, a group was able to share the energy amongst themselves, but even they were quickly destroyed by it. But as their population on the planet grew, it would have put an increased strain on the power grid. So all those people using all that power overloaded the system, causing this giant blast of energy to come from the power stone and destroyed the entire planet. Which from space, or Titan's moon, would probably look very similar to what we see in this concept art. Anyways, I, like I said, I know this is purely theoretical, but sometimes it's fun to do a purely speculative video and just kind of go down a rabbit hole of different possibilities. But anyways, before we go, let's do one more section and talk about some of the other stuff that we learned from the Art of Avengers Endgame book. Ron has located the Power Stone. I'm dispatching you to a ship. Not you, okay, so first off, one of the things we got to see that, I, that stuck out to me is we got to see several different versions of what Nebula might have looked like before Thanos started upgrading her with machinery and mechanical parts. Which this art that shows how she used to look is much closer to what Nebula used to look like in the comics. 
Then we also learned that the villainous 2014 version of Nebula was originally going to have a very different death scene than what happened in the actual movie. Originally, the 2014 version of Nebula was going to get a hold of the Infinity Gauntlet during the final battle. And when this happened, in order to prove to her father Thanos that she was not weak, she would then use the gauntlet, which would have killed her which is directly influenced by what happened in the Infinity Gauntlet comics. Then we also got some confirmation on what exactly the quantum time suits were made from, which technology they were made from, which was that the characters that were necessary to make the time suits were Tony, Rocket, and Scott, and that the basic starting off point for the quantum time suits was Hank Pym's quantum suit that we saw in Ant-Man and the Wasp. But then Tony Stark had to integrate his nanotechnology into the suits, along with the time travel GPS wristbands. And then lastly, Rocket was also involved in creating these suits, and he added the blue force filled technology that we saw Drax wear in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Another interesting tidbit with these time suits is they were at one point going to be called Kronos, which seems to definitely be an Easter egg to the character Kronos, who was one of the first Eternals and Thanos' grandfather. And we've talked about this in past videos, that Kronos was involved with an accident with cosmic energy that turned him into a cosmic entity, and he basically became like the cosmic god of time. So that would have been a perfect name for these quantum time suits that would have also been an Easter egg to Kronos, who is the time god and also Thanos' grandfather. And speaking of Thanos, there is so much cool Thanos concept art in this book that shows Thanos at the different stages in his life with the different titles that the concept artists and the Russo brothers gave him while making the movie. Like in these images, we get to see Thanos' age progression going back to like when he was a teenager and then to where he later ended up in Infinity War. And then what I meant by saying that we get to see Thanos at the different stages in his life and the different titles he had is, for instance, in Avengers Infinity War, we saw the older version of Thanos and the Russo brothers called this version of Thanos, Thanos the Philosopher. And this version of Thanos is, you know, he's a bit older, a bit wiser, and he no longer needs to wear his armor once he starts collecting the stones. Then in Avengers Endgame, we saw the 2014 version of Thanos, which was the same Thanos we saw in Guardians of the Galaxy. And this version of Thanos was referred to as either Thanos the Warrior or Thanos the Destroyer. And what separates this version of Thanos from the older version of Thanos is that this version of Thanos will actually go down and lead his army and lead his forces into battle. In fact, originally they were actually going to show Thanos actually leading his army into a battle in Avengers Endgame. And it was the scene in Endgame where we first see Nebula and Gamora, the 2014 versions of Nebula and Gamora. And we see them battling these kind of weird looking mech aliens. Well, originally during that portion of the movie, it was going to show Thanos leading his army down on the planet below against these same aliens. Okay, so there's Thanos the Philosopher that we saw in Avengers Infinity War, the older version of Thanos. Then there's Thanos the Warrior that we saw in Guardians of the Galaxy and Avengers Endgame. But in the book, it also shows that there was a version of Thanos that the concept artists were working on that would have been the version in between these two. And this version of Thanos they called Thanos the Warlord. And at this point, Thanos isn't going down to lead his armies into battle as much anymore. Instead, he relegates that duty to the Black Order. So this version of Thanos still wears armor, but it's a little bit lighter and a little bit more regal and king-like. And I think as far as the concept art goes, this is my favorite version of Thanos because it's like he's this cosmic cult leader or something. And he doesn't just have the Black Order by his side, but he also has these dark hooded figures. And I'm not exactly sure who these characters are supposed to be, these hooded characters, but I think it might be two things. The first is something else that I read about in the book, which was originally we were actually going to see more versions of the Ma race. So of course one of the members of the Black Order is Ebony Ma, 
but apparently they were going to include other Maws in the final battle for Avengers Endgame, and the Maws would have been a race of alien wizards. And then the other option of who these hooded characters could be is the Chitari priests. So I think it's one of those two. And speaking of the Chitari, that's another thing we got to see more of in the Art of books. And the Chitari are way more diverse than we would have originally thought when we saw them in the first Avengers movie. Because in the first Avengers movie, those Chitari that we saw are the lowest tier of the Chitari forces. You know, just pure cannon fodder. But the Chitari are a race of insectoid aliens, and they are constantly mixing technology with genetic engineering to further evolve themselves and evolve their species. And they're always experimenting on new things and creating new creatures. So in the final battle of Avengers Endgame, one of the new things we saw were the Chitari gorillas, which I thought were really cool. Then we also, of course, saw the Chitari Leviathans, which we first saw in the first Avengers movie. But in the Art of book, we get to see that originally the plan was to introduce us to several new variations on the Leviathans. Like we have this land-walking Leviathan that looks like a creature from the movie The Mist. Then we also have the Sandworm Leviathan, which would have been a worm Leviathan that had drills on it and could travel underground. And there's also a bunch of different versions and takes on the Godzilla Leviathan, which would have been this giant Godzilla Chitari. And apparently in the movie at one point, they wanted to have the Godzilla Leviathan battle against Ant-Man turning into Giant Man. Which again, would have been awesome. They should, I understand why they cut it from the movie because I think they just, at a certain point, big is not better. It's just more spectacle. But that, come on, that would have been cool to see. But anyways, enough with all that. That was just kind of an excuse for me. I'm a huge fan of the concept art, so any excuse I get to talk about the concept art. Anyways, come hit me up on Twitter and let me know your topic requests or just to say what's up or just to see my random tweets on other things and also a lot of Marvel tweets and whatever. And you can check out other recent videos linked in the description down below. Oh, and sharing the video is greatly appreciated and helps the channel a lot, so do that if you liked it. All right, cool. Thank you so much, everyone. I will be back soon.